Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another science fiction discussion video. For those who don't know, recently we've started covering science fiction short stories on the channel. I've done videos so far on I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, The Last Question, and previously other works by authors like H.P. Lovecraft. Today, we'll be covering another work by a titan of science fiction as we break down The Nine Billion Names of God by Arthur C. Clarke. This story is very, very short, and I'd actually recommend that you read it before you watch this video because I think it's worth experiencing on your own. But if you'd rather just listen to an explanation, we'll cover that first, and then look at different themes and connections to other works. The great thing is lots of these stories came out in the 50s or the 60s. This one was 1953, so most that I've covered can actually be found very, very easily online. Anyway, the story starts off with a scientist in Manhattan meeting with a Tibetan monk trying to set up a deal which would see the monk buy an advanced computer known as a Mark V automatic science computer. Obviously, a Tibetan monastery is a weird place for a computer to end up, and the monk's reason for purchasing it is even stranger. So, by modern standards, this is a basic machine and they're buying it mostly for its brute force and computational functions. These monks have been working on a project for over 300 years. Essentially, they're creating massive books which have every single combination of letter within their language, or at least every combination under nine letters. Why? Well, I'll let the monk explain. There's a philosophical problem of some difficulty here, which I do not propose to discuss, but somewhere along all the possible combinations of letters that can occur are what one may call the real names of God. By systematic permutation of letters, we have been trying to list them all. That's what the monk says here, we do learn more later. So by this description, they're essentially brute forcing the name of God. You can imagine what they've been doing like this. The very first thing they wrote was the letter A nine times, and the final thing they write is the letter Z nine times. However, there are some restrictions. For example, no letter for some reason should be repeated more than three times in a row, and they've got their own alphabet, but those are really just some minor details. Eventually, the scientist and the monk work out a deal, the machine is paid for, and along with a pair of technologies, missions is sent to Tibet to begin the process. What originally would have taken 15,000 years, the printing of all names will now take only 100 days. Fairly impressive. They must have a few printers set up. Three months later, the project is nearing its end, and we move to the perspective of technicians within the Himalayan mountains. The machine has been printing off pages and pages of what they call gibberish, which the monks have been cutting out and placing in books. However, the technicians learn more about the goal of the monks. They're not doing this just because they can or for some deeply philosophical reason, rather they believe it's basically their job, divined from God. Here's another quote. Well, they believe that when they have listed all his names, and they reckon that there are about 9 billion of them, God's purpose will be achieved, the human race will have finished what it was created to do, and there won't be any point in carrying on. Indeed, the very idea is something like blasphemy. Then what do they need us to do? Commit suicide? There's no need for that. When the list completed, God steps in and simply winds things up. Bingo. Oh, I get it. When we finish our job, it will be the end of the world. Chuck gave a nervous little laugh. That's what I said to Sam, and you know what happened? He looked at me in a very queer way, like I'd been stupid in class, and said, it's nothing as trivial as that. Obviously the technicians realize that this probably is just superstition, they don't take it very seriously, but are worried how the monks will react when the project fails and they finish completing off all pages and nothing happens. Not because they're worried about being harmed really, but because they don't want to be there when the monks discover that 300 years of work was basically for nothing. As the project is very, very near completion, they set it up so they're heading towards the plane to depart as the final pages are printing off. It's very peaceful, there's no danger, and the seclusion in the mountains is almost over. The two men leaving definitely share a sense of relief. The sky overhead was perfectly clear, and ablaze with the familiar, friendly stars. At least there would be no risk, thought George, of the pilot being unable to take off because of weather conditions. That had been his only remaining worry. He began to sing, but gave it up after a while, the vast area of mountains gleaming like whitely hooded ghosts on every side, did not encourage such ebullience. Presently, George glanced at his watch. Should be there in an hour. 
He called back over his shoulder to Chuck, then he added in an afterthought, wonder if the computer's finished its run, it was due about now. Chuck didn't reply, so George swung around in his saddle. He could just see Chuck's face, a white oval turned towards the sky. Look, whispered Chuck, and George lifted his eyes to heaven. There is always a last time for everything. Overhead, without any fuss, the stars were going out. And that is the end of the story. Coinciding with the finishing of the Monk's project, we see stars disappearing from the night sky. And this reflects a hint we got earlier. Finishing this project would not only bring forth the end of Earth, but the end of all things. God ending creation and returning everything to perhaps as it was. Within the universe, this is a very interesting and open-ended ending. Obviously, we know what's happening, but we don't know the truth of what's going on. From a literary perspective, the meaning is also, I think, very open to interpretation. Arthur C. Clarke was an atheist, but many of his works deal with God. I think this one especially deals with the uncertainty of interacting with faith, sort of the unknowability of God and of other people's religion, especially as an outsider without faith. I think this is interesting from a theistic perspective as well. It's interesting because we don't really know what God was looking for, and there's actually some contradictions even within the story itself. First of all, we're told that the names of God will be within the results that have been printed off, but later it almost seems like the name of God is reflected in all of the results, and that every single option needs to be printed. Notably, God only hits the big power off, or perhaps reset button, once the project is fully completed. If his name were just in the results somewhere, then you'd probably expect that to have happened earlier. Interestingly, the monk says that the human race will have finished what it was created to do, after all the names have been printed off. And interestingly, that God's purpose will have been achieved. But we have to wonder, why? Was God doing this? Was he making humanity do this? Because perhaps it was a way to understand and himself, seeing how his creations would achieve such a thing, whether perhaps they had the actual dedication to do so, was this a test for humanity to see whether they could make it to heaven, or perhaps maybe that humans actually fail the test here by using computers and bypassing the supposed 15,000 years of hard work? Is it possible that humanity actually failed? That they didn't have the 15,000 years they would have otherwise? This is a very interesting story for all of these reasons, and it very clearly has a god that not only destroys the earth, but also the entire universe. From humanity's standpoint, this is obviously a very self-centered view of religion, and it sort of ties in nicely to another one of Arthur C. Clarke's works, The Star. And I'll only detail this very briefly, I can do an entire video on it later if you'd like, but it's also short enough that you can read quickly. Basically, and there will be some spoilers here if you do want to read it on your own, we learn that the star which indicated the birth of Jesus was caused by the destruction of a massive star which also destroyed an entire civilization. The main character who's conflicted throughout the story is very religious, and I first thought when I read this as a much younger person that the conflict was just that, oh, he's realizing that what was supposed to herald the birth of Jesus was just a coincidence. It wasn't really an act of God, it was just a supernova. However, there's another interpretation, and one I think more heavily supposed by the story, especially the final lines. And that is, what kind of god would be so cruel as to mark the coming of his son by destroying an entire civilization? Which I think similarly deals with humanocentrism, or human preference, in a universe that is almost infinitely vast, and which would most likely house other intelligent life. So I think that's really an interesting point to think about. But let's move back to the story, and I want to look at things too from a practical perspective. One interesting thing to talk about is the fact that Arthur C. Clarke was British, and when he wrote this, the British use of billion referred to what we now in the world, or at his time, North Americans and perhaps other parts of Europe, I'm not sure, would refer to as a trillion. So a modern titling of this story would probably be the nine trillion names of God. 
basically a thousand times more. So again, there's some very, very impressive printing power going on there. And if you look at the ninth root of nine trillion, we get the number 27 and a half. So when you factor in the limits to the machine, like not repeating letters three times or more, we get presumably an alphabet pretty similar to our own. Now again, it's not clear if there were more names than just the nine trillion written down, or perhaps if Arthur C. Clarke really did mean billion, but it's just an interesting look at the sort of mathematics behind what's going on. But that's all I have for today's video. The math might be wrong. I, it's been a long time since I've been in university or high school. Let me know what you thought of this story down below. Is there any sci-fi you'd like to see next? Which of the sci-fi stories that I've covered so far was your favorite? I'll make sure to include a playlist and a pinned comment that you guys can check out for the prior videos. Till next time though guys, let me know what you thought of everything in this video and more. Leave a like, subscribe, and turn notifications on. Have a great day, and of course, may the force be with you.